My name is Sarah Parshall Perry. I am a senior legal fellow at the Heritage Foundation. As a former varsity athlete, the mother of a girls varsity athlete, and former senior counsel for civil rights at Department of Education, I have, as the saying goes, skin in this game. What we're discussing today is an athletic scandal, a fraud of unprecedented proportions perpetrated by the federal government on American students. It turns obvious distinctions between the sexes into nothing more than the myths of a bygone era, while expecting female athletes to simply look the other way. In education, one law should stand as a bulwark against sex discrimination as it has for the 50 years since its inception. And yet, the department's rulemaking on Title IX purports to provide for the participation of men in women's sports, rendering the sex discrimination of old, new again. Title IX made possible opportunities for women historically excluded from higher education, athletics, graduate school, scholarships, and more. Because of the law, the rate of girls' participation in high school athletics is now 1,000% higher. Girls now constitute over 56% of American college students and 42% of high school athletes and 94% of female executives played scholastic sports. Title IX was the crowning achievement of the feminist movement. Its origins incontrovertibly in women's liberation, spurred by statements made by the, the judge famously who proclaimed in 1971, athletic competition builds character in our boys. We don't need that kind of character in our girls. And yet, by threatening to gut Title IX's guarantee of equality, the department is on the cusp of perpetuating just this type of regressive thinking. There are two rules at issue, the latter of which governs criteria for athletics between athletic interests of women and transgender-identified men, the department has called the rule a compromise, but a compromise it most definitely is not. Instead, it is a self-refuting tangle of considerations, a bureaucratic nightmare for any educational institution to which it applies. It doesn't clarify Title IX's sex-based criteria in sports. It complicates it. It departs from decades of Title IX's application to athletics, obscures the plain text of the long-standing athletics regulation with vague terms, an unworkable standard, and the guaranteed conflict with the contrary laws of 23 states. It balances the equities against the women and girls who were at the heart of Title IX's passage and impressively does all this while violating constitutional, civil rights, and administrative law. The coup de grace, there is a reason to argue that the department even lacks the authority to promulgate an athletics regulation in the first place. Then there is the rule's refusal to acknowledge obvious sex-based competitive advantages to sport. Males have greater lung capacity, larger hearts, more bone density, more muscle mass. They jump higher, throw further, run faster, accelerate quicker, and punch harder than females. And this gap emerges as early as the age of 12 when males experience a 20-fold boost in testosterone. Title IX and its implementing regulations contain a set of limited sex affirmative exceptions allowing schools to take sex into account and a sex binary. Male versus female is the foundation upon which the entire statute rests. Its use of the words both and either reinforces this longstanding understanding. Even the Supreme Court's determination in Bostock versus Clayton County that sex discrimination in employment also includes discrimination based on sexual orientation and transgender status does nothing to change that, nor did the Supreme Court intend to. When biological boys are glibly classified as girls, the feminist gains of the past 50 years are eviscerated. Womanhood cannot be achieved by puberty blockers or cross-sex hormones, and it deserves the continued protection of Title IX. I urge this chamber not to rewind the clock on women's progress, but rather hold fast to the principles of equality. The future of women's sports depends on it. If a self-declaration of womanhood and hormones are sufficient to open women's sports to men, what, after all, was the point of the women's liberation movement? I welcome your questions. 
Thank you, Ms. Pierce.